topic for tonight's talk, and I'm glad to see that they're suitably light-hearted and frivolous topics. The nature of consciousness, fatalism and free will, it's a good one, and dualism. Right, so there you go. See if we can knock those three little philosophical problems over in one evening. So I'll start with... Starting with consciousness is a good place to start. It's a good place to finish up as well, but it's a good place to start. The Buddha said the mind is the forerunner of all things. Mano Pubangama Dhamma. Which is different from saying that the mind is all things. So what the Buddha was saying that, that the mind is a, a formative force, a creative force in the world. He's not saying that the mind is the only thing that there is in the world. This is a very important distinction. The idea that, the, that, that there's only mind and nothing else exists is in philosophy what they call idealism. And uh, this is... Uh, one philosophical kind of point of view is developed by certain um, thinkers in the West and it's generally, be generally believed or generally asserted that uh, one of the Mahayana schools, the Yogacara school, uh, believed that everything in the world was just the mind, okay? so that the world is just an illusion, it only exists in the mind. Whether that's historically accurate description of the Yogacara school is disputable. But certainly it's not the mainstream position of most of the Buddhist schools. <coughs> the other extreme of that, idealism, is what they call realism in philosophy. And realism in philosophy doesn't mean the same thing as realism in the sense of realism as opposed to, you know, um, realism and idealism doesn't mean in, in everyday language, if you're very idealistic, that means you think everything is going to be wonderful or whatever. You say that you're an idealistic person got nothing to do with that meaning. Realism uh, in philosophy means the idea that the world truly, wooly exists out there independently of me or the observer. Okay, So it exists out there. And this is like another extreme. Okay, So this is how the Buddha would tend to formulate his approach to these philosophical problems. He would say, well, this idea that the world is only in the mind and nothing out there exists, this is one extreme. The idea that, that, that everything is purely objective and exists independently of the mind, this is another extreme. Okay? And leaving those two extremes aside, then I teach Dhamma by the middle way. Mantena Dhamma Kese. So this is very, very typical of how the Buddha would present these kinds of problems. Now what does it mean when the Buddha said that he, te he, he, he taught Dhamma by the middle way. How does that middle way um, avoid those two extremes? <coughs> Again, coming back to the idea that the mind is the forerunner, the mind is the originator. When the Buddha taught of um, the escape from these two extremes, he usually phrased that in terms of dependent origination. And the first term, the first word in dependent origination, avijja, unknowing, okay? ignorance, cognitive blindness, the mind that doesn't see, so this is the start of all our problems, is the mind that doesn't see. And of course, conversely, the mind that does see is the start of the path to Nibbana. <coughs> and if we start with that, we start with that uh, knowing mind that is free from these 
um, these extremes or these dualities which we impose on reality. So the idea of idealism is, an, is, is, is just an idea. The idea of realism is just an idea. We impose these ideas on reality. And we interpret reality that way. So we don't get involved in that. What is our experience like? What is the, what is the actual experience of knowing like? Let's start with that. When we start, when we when you start to investigate and reflect on that, the first thing that you realize is how ineffable it is, how ambiguous, how strange, how difficult to describe and pin down this thing we call consciousness is. It's extraordinary. Everything we ever n have known. Everything we know right now and everything we will know is nothing other than consciousness. And yet, what is that consciousness? We haven't got any idea. We're totally alienated from the nature of our consciousness itself. It doesn't occur to us as we go around our lives to investigate and reflect, what is this thing called consciousness? You know, what, is, what do we like in our lives? Say, oh, I like coffee. Okay? Beauty random example here. <laughs> what is it? It's a sight, it's a smell, it's a taste. All of those things. But they're all things which we experience in consciousness. Yeah? What else do we like? You like elephants. Pick another random example. What is elephants? Sight, sound, smell, taste. There is a consciousness of these things and an idea in our mind. What else do we like? We like clothes. We like the beach. We like music. We like Buddhism. Again, this is just all happening in our consciousness, but it's but what is that consciousness itself? And we start to look into it and it's almost as if our mind you know, the mind slides off. Consciousness is so um, um, elusive that the mind slides off it. And it's difficult to to um, to fix the attention with enough uh, clarity to be able to start to really discern what's going on. So of course this is why we do meditation. Yeah, we do meditation to learn how to steady our mind, clarify our mind, bring mindfulness, simplify our mind, simplify what's going on, so we can start to understand these things. Yeah? If we if there's a million thoughts going through our mind can't understand it, it's too much. But if there's one thought going through our mind, oh, okay, maybe we can start to start to get an understanding of what's going on there. So, one of the ways that we um, try to, mm, like, when we want to uh, try to understand nature of consciousness, we, 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 we can't help but use words to try to point to it. And of course these words themselves can uh, and very often are the source of a lot of confusion. So it's, it's useful to, to clarify these things. And of course it's especially confusing in Buddhism because we are dealing with translated terms that were developed within a very different context in ancient India, with different assumptions brought to bear, different culture, different purposes to the words. But one thing that is very interesting, and I find is very interesting, is that most of the words that we use in English to know something, uh, or very many of them, are, are from what we call the Indo-European language, the primitive Indo-European language, which means it's the ancestral language of almost all Indian European languages, and what that tells are words like, for example, uh, vision, video, knowing, cognizing, uh, and so on. All of these come from these ancient uh, primitive Indo-European roots. So that tell wit is another one. Wit comes from that. Uh, many others. Which, a 
in the, the witches is fly, the ones who fly through the air on broomsticks. It's also from the same root, wit meaning one who has a secret knowledge. Yeah? So that shows us that that particular cultural strand <laughs> was very interested in the mind and would talk about the mind. Yeah? That was what they were interested in. That's one of the cultural inheritances we have from that. The fact that they have words for it tells us that they were interested in it. Now, in um, Pali or in the, in the Indic, Indic languages, they have various words they use for the, for the mind. So you'll hear these words. If you hang around in Buddhism long enough, you hear the word citta, for example. Yeah, citta is often used to mean the mind uh, in a very general sense. Mano is used to mean the mind in a sense, more in a sense of active or, or intentional mind. Vijnana is used in the sense of consciousness, awareness itself. Yeah? So these are different words that are used with a different nuance. Uh, uh, of the mind. And similarly, in the English language, you have these different words. Mind is used in a very general sense, very kind of vague sense. Sometimes when philosophers try to be a bit more technical, they use the word intentionality. Doesn't really mean all that much. Or you use the word cognition or consciousness. all just different words that we're trying to point to this thing and it's you know, difficult to um, um, to tease out the differences or to be very entirely consistent in how we talk about the, the different aspects of it. But the essential um, the most I think the most important point the really crucial distinction so leaving all of those things aside there's one distinction in understanding of our mind, which is, I think, which is crucial, and everything else is secondary to that. So just now, just and as you're sitting there, you put your attention inside. Are you sitting there listening quietly? Hear the sounds of planes disappearing in the distance. You can hear my voice. You can feel the sensations around you, the sensations. So this is all, con you are conscious of these things. You are aware of these things. So you can feel that there's a, like an inside and an outside to this experience. The inside, there's a sense of knowing. And outside is the known. This is a very important distinction. There's this inner, the, the inside sense, the one that feels like he's living inside, living in the heart or living in the brain or wherever he lives, doesn't matter, and he's peeking outside through a window. And that's it, it's the inside and the outside. And those outside things may be thought. We, we, know, we are aware of the thoughts and that of suggests that there's a slight cutoff, there's a distinction, there's, there's, there's a knowing in here, aware of the thoughts. We're conscious of our feelings, we're conscious of our memories. Yeah, so there's this distinction between what's in here and what's going on out there. And this is I think the most basic and the most important distinction to be made in understanding consciousness the difference between the, the knowing inside and what is known. And this distinction is very fundamental in the Indian philosophy and uh, the teachings especially of Yajnavalkya, the great Indian sage before the Buddha, and he would talk about the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unthought thinker, the unknown knower. Yeah? So it's not what you can see, but it's what's seen, not what you can hear, but what's seen. So this is what this unknown knower, this is what uh, we are referring to in Buddhism when we talk about consciousness. Okay, so the word vijnana in Buddhism, that's what it means. It means that, that that inner sense of knowing awareness of something, consciousness of something. So this is a crucial distinction that we make. Now notice that here I'm making this distinction 
But what I'm trying to do is I'm drawing this distinction out of our actual experience. Yeah. So I mentioned I'll talk a bit, 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 uh, mentioned the idea of the, 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 the dualism. Okay, or the dualism of things. So if we come to the problem of, of consciousness with an idea that that it's it, it, it's like this or it's like that and we try to work that out through our thinking, we end up with these categories which we then impose on experience. Okay? So what I'm trying to do is to not to, to impose those categories on experience, but to draw them out of experience okay? as much as we can, at least provisionally. Okay? There are deeper issues here, but at least provisionally we can draw this out of experience. We sit there, we feel there's this inwardness and this outwardness something the Buddha talks about again and again and again. One contemplates internally, one contemplates externally. One contemplates internally, externally. Okay? So you break down that distinction. And so I'm not saying that this distinction is an absolute or a final distinction. I'm just saying that it's usually how our consciousness seems to operate. That's all. So this inside here is called vinyana. The outside, usually the outside aspect of consciousness the usual term in early Buddhism we call Nama Rupa. It's, ne with, it's usually translated as name and form. Okay? And name and form is all of those things that we're aware of. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, all of these things. Feelings, thoughts, memories, perceptions, imagination, internal visions, images of things. All of that content of consciousness comes under the name of Nama Rupa. Okay? Name and form. A, it's a technical term in Buddhist philosophy. So I won't go into the, the background of why those particular words. It's a slightly um, unusual idiom, but it has its roots in, in Indian philosophy. And I don't need to go into that, but just so that's, that's the terminology that we use. The inner is the vijnana, the outer is the nama rupa, the, the name and form. Now notice how that, if that's the basic distinction, notice where the line is drawn. Okay, so this is very important. When we're, we're doing philosophy, we want to analyze things. Where do we take our scalpel and make a cut in reality? This is very important, right? It's like if you're a surgeon, right? <laughs> if, you, if you have a patient, you want your doctor to have a realistic understanding of which bits belong where in your body you know, before they get the scalpel out. Yeah? And you don't want them to have some kind of kooky idea which they've dreamed up. Yeah? <laughs> and they say, no, 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 actually this bit belongs over here. I'm going to cut this out and put it over there. Right? But of course, this is what philosophers can do, you see, and because the results are usually not so immediately fatal, they kind of get away with it. Yeah? Oh, no, actually this bit belongs over there. We'll just sort of stuff that in there and, ah, oh, it's much better now. So this is why we try to, we, we sort of step back from it. We don't bring those ideas, we, we try to look, oh, okay, what's going on? Draw that out and then very carefully kind of tease it apart. Yeah? And if we have to cut with our knife, we do so very carefully. Yeah? We might be having to stitch it back up again later. So where I've drawn that distinction is between the inner sense of awareness and the outer sense of what we are aware of. Yeah? Now. That what we are aware of is both mental things and physical things. Okay, we are aware of the feeling of touch, yeah? sight. These are physical things. <coughs> We're also aware of mental things, you know, thoughts and emotions and so on and so forth. And so the basic distinction is not between the mind and the body. Okay? Now this is something where Buddhism is very different from Western philosophy, and of course in Western philosophy, one of the great philosophical problems is what they call mind-body dualism. And very often when uh, in Western philosophy we refer to dualism, it's, we, we don't just mean dualism in, as a general question, we mean specifically mind-body dualism. It's the most famous form of dualism. And mind-body dualism basically postulates that the mind and the body are completely distinct entities. They're totally different things, and they have completely different kinds of characteristics. Okay? So 
So, for example, the, the, the mind has the characteristic of, of uh, not having any mass, for example. It doesn't have any shape. Doesn't, it can't be defined by those physical measures, whereas, whereas the body can be defined by mass and shape and so on. So we, we, we make this distinction. And of course, the philosopher Descartes was the most famous for <coughs> making this distinction. Of course, the problem is, once you've said that the, the mind and the body are, are two distinct entities, then the question is, how do they relate to each other? Yeah? You've, you've separated these things out in thought, and then now you, you well, what, are, what actually are these two? How, how, how do they do it? If the mind has nothing to do with physical things, how does that actually influence the body? Yeah? How does it tell the body to get up or to, to talk or anything like that? So this is a, this is a, 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 a deep and deadly problem in Western philosophy. It's an absolutely um, killing problem. It's, it's almost destroyed the, the philosophy of, of mind in, in Western philosophy for, for hundreds of years, is, is the attempt to resolve this issue. And some people try to resolve it by saying, get rid of the mind altogether. That's how frustrated they get trying to solve these different, get rid of the mind and you just have the body. Yeah, so then we say that the, the mind is, is brain processes. Okay? So we don't simply say that, that brain processes correlate to mind or have a relationship with mind, but we say that mind is nothing other than the chemical processes happening in the brain. So uh, this is this problem. Dualism. So from a Buddhist point of view, Dualism is a very curious thing because if we start from experience, the reality of our experience is exactly opposite to that. The reality of our experience is that we experience uh, the world that we live in every moment is nothing other than the relationship, the interconnection, the constant uh, intermixing and flowing of of qualities of me mental and physical qualities which are always present together the primary data that we get is a mixture of of these things happening together in consciousness the primary data we get is an awareness of light an awareness of sounds together mixed up with emotional responses to that memories perception filtering and all of these things the mind and, and mental and physical things are happening, they're completely mixed up, and only by a process of theory and abstraction and so on can we even begin to tease these things out. So from a Buddhist point of view, it's not that mind and separateness of mind and body is primary, and we have to figure out how to join them. It's exactly the opposite problem. The problem is that mind and body are mixed up, and that we have to learn how to separate them at least, to, at least to understand the difference between them. So we're not talking about to separate them completely, but to, to understand the different uh, aspects and qualities and properties that these things have. So this is how we approach uh, the question of, of consciousness in Buddhism. And of course, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, the issue is not uh, consciousness mind, not mind-body, not dualism or anything like that. The issue is freedom. That's the issue in Buddhism. The issue is freedom. How do we find freedom from suffering, freedom from oppression, freedom from all of these things? And what the Buddha noticed was that we tend to identify with different aspects of, our, of the mind, the body, the, the experience that we're having. Okay? And when we identify with those things, <coughs> th that identification happens in different ways, in different, different stages of our life, in different moments, it happens in different ways for different people, but there's always this atten tendency to identify with some aspect of our experience and to take that as being me, my, mine, myself. So, uh, for and, and when we get attached to it, that thing changes, it disappears, and we suffer because of that. And so, of course, we all know that there's so many examples of this. We buy a new pair of jeans. We think that those jeans are wonderful. Then they get old and so on. 
and we're not so attached to them anymore. I had a friend who had a um, uh, motorbike. That was his favorite thing in the whole world was his motorbike. And uh, he was just so in love with his motorbike. He, I, I was, he, he used to, <laughs> he, he, I was staying at, in, a, in a hut in a kuti in northern Thailand. And he was sponsoring me to stay there, and he would come out and bring food and so on. And he'd, he'd built a hut for himself to stay on this piece of land. And uh, he designed the hut specially so that the door of the hut was really big so he could drive his motorbike into the hut and park it there. So it wouldn't have to be outside. <laughs> so that's what we call attachment. So, you know, so here we have like an external physical thing, physical object. And of course, we all know that's what you know, blokes like to attach to is some kind of machine or something like that. And he said that, you know, the first after he got that, he was so in love with this bike. But then the first time it had some kind of problem with it. And he took it along to the garage and the, the guys immediately just took it to pieces. Yeah. And he said he just, uh, he, he just, this whole kind of attachment just sort of fell away. You know, it's just like, you know, it's just a machine. It's just bits of metal bolted together. Yeah? And uh, so this is the nature of attachment. So this is one of the, um, the ways that we do that. Okay? So this is one of the ways, like a, a, a technique that you can use to help overcome that attachment, okay? is to break things down into parts. You say that, that thing that I'm attached to, actually it's just, it's just all these bits that are sort of spun together to p perform some function. And that may be an external thing like a motorbike or it may be the, our body. And of course, our, our, again, what the Buddha noticed is that you know we tend to have um, we, ha we tend to have that attachment or that identification with external things, right? Which is more immediate. It's more obvious. Yeah, you can see that you know people wandering down the street and looking in the shop windows and stuff like that and getting attached to things, and you can see that identification with those external things is quite clear. But the attachment to the more subtle our attachments get, the less obvious they become, yeah? but the stronger they are. Yeah? So our attachment to our own body yeah, is also very strong. Yeah? And we see that when our body breaks down. We see that when we get sick. Yeah? We get so worried that when we get sick. So this is another reason, place where, where um, uh, sort of constructive pessimism is, is very useful. Yeah? And you just reflect, well, it, it's the nature of the body to get sick. It's one of the daily reflections for Buddhists, is to say, this body, it's of the nature to get sick. Yeah? It's ordinary. Getting sick is normal. And uh, a state of health is just a temporary reprieve from sickness. Yeah? You should be more worried by health than you are worried about sickness. Yeah? You're worried about health, and you think, oh, God, what's around the corner now? Apparently, that's what apparently Billy Connolly said. That's what they say in, in Glasgow. They said whenever they have a bright, sunny, clear day, they look up in the sky and they go, "Oh, we're going to pay for this." <laughs> apparently, in in ancient China, they used to, and this is, I think, a very good idea. I think we should adopt now. They used to pay their doctor to keep them healthy. That's a very good idea, isn't it? Yeah, and you sack them when you get sick. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, they're not doing their job. Yeah. I think that's quite quite good. So you, every, 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 you're sick all the time. We're all sick. We've all got something wrong with us. You know, if we could all if we all wanted to sit round, we could all bore each other. For hours on end, by, by by relating all of the things that we've got wrong with it with each other, you know, I've got a dodgy knee and I've got hay fever and somebody else has got this, and we can just sit down, and bodies are breaking down all around us, yeah? and that's normal. And you multiply that by billions, billions of sick people in the world, yeah, and yet somehow we expect to be healthy, we take it for granted, yeah, and we think that that um, that something's wrong when we get sick. So this is it's sort of starting to come home. But then even more than our body is, is we, 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 we then identify with the, the inner aspects, with, with the mind as well. Yeah? So we identify with our thoughts and our feelings. This is something I really, I first started to notice. I mean, I, I, I had, yeah, 
I had no, no idea. I'd never reflected on these things before I started to meditate. And it's only after my first retreat, I did this month-long retreat in Chiang Mai. And uh, <coughs> then after I came out and, and I went back to the guest house I was staying in, and you just kind of sit around the table and, and chatting with people. And, you know, the kind of ordinary chit-chat that people have when you're a tourist, oh, I'm going to go here or do this or whatever. And you could just see, it was just so, so obvious how um, instantly they, they, would, they would identify with their thoughts or with their, their ideas or their opinions. Yeah? And there's this completely unreflective identification with your opinion. And so this is, this is what I started to notice uh, after having done some meditation. Of course, you realize this is what you're doing in meditation. You start to watch that. It doesn't mean you stop doing it. It doesn't mean you stop identifying with them. But it means you've got some reflective capacity around that. Oh, actually, it's just a thought. Yeah? Oh, it's just an opinion. Yeah? And you start also to understand that uh, thoughts and ways of using your mind um, are not kind of neutral. They have, they have effects. They come from places. They do things. If you, f if, you, if you think in a certain, if you find yourself thinking in a certain way, then that's, why is that? Yeah? That's, being, that's being prompted by something. It's being pushed by some motivation. There's something in you that wants to think that way. Yeah? There's a push that makes you want to think that way. So we have this like fallacy in, in, uh, in philosophy or in Western reason of like this idea of pure reason. Yeah? That you can sort of start with purely abstract um, tenets and then sort of build up a philosophy of the truth out of that, which is what um, Plato tried to do. And of course, it's a fallacy because you're, you're actually the, you, the, the, the thought that you're doing that is, is always interacting with your emotions, with your, your preferences, with your experiences. There's no such thing as pure reason. Yeah? It's always being fueled by your memories, the categories that you've developed in your mind and so on. And so we, we identify with these things, we identify with our emotions, we identify with our thoughts, we identify with our beliefs, and that's a very powerful one, isn't it? Yeah? We identify with your beliefs. I'm a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Democrat, I'm a whatever it is. Yeah? And like we create beliefs and tastes and so on in order to, to, to differentiate ourselves. Yeah, and we do that in almost every sphere of life, you know, so you have a particular kind of food that you like. You know, I'm a connoisseur of X, Y, Z. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wine connoisseur, yeah? I know, how, I'm, I know how to tell the difference between good wine and bad wine. All of these things, this is developing more things to identify with. But what the Buddha said is that all of those things, while they're important, and while they all need to be looked at, uh, they all kind of pale into insignificance behind our identification with the knowing itself, yeah? vijnana itself, consciousness, the awareness of. So in all of those things, the commonality to all of those things, the commonality to physical things, material possessions, physical body, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, dreams, fantasies, imaginings. All of these things are things which we are aware of, things which we are conscious of. And things which we are not conscious of or not aware of, of course, we don't attach to those things. that knowing, that knowing mind is the most subtle and the most uh, potent form of attachment there is. And so this is something which, which uh, our um, Buddhist meditation helps us to understand, to reflect on, to get some space around and to get some distance from. When we're practicing meditation, you know, we have the, the two aspects of meditation which we always emphasize is samatha and vipassana, tranquility and insight. And those two will work together to overcome this attachment. This is samatha meditation, 
making the mind peaceful, making the mind calm, making the mind tranquil, you learn to get a still point to observe with the clarity of the mind. In that still point, watching, and we begin to get this sense of what is that unknown knower? There's something that's almost we can't look at it directly. We can only catch a glimpse of it, like out of the corner of our eye in a mirror or something like that. And we catch glimpses of this thing. And then, so this is like the, the, the samatha aspect is the, the, that, that clear, steady gaze. And then the vipassana enables us to reflect on that. So we step back, we, we investigate on that experience. And when we see that our experience is made up of everything that we know, ev our whole life is made up of this inner sense of knowing and the outer things which, are, which we, know, we know of. And we realize that these things are always changing. It's not that the inner sense of knowing is some kind of permanent, stable, uh, <coughs> eternal essence. This is just the nature of consciousness. So the nature of the consciousness is always to be conditioned. Okay? These things are always conditioning each other. And this is what the Buddha said again and again and again. So there's these other extremes which sometimes we hear talked about in Buddhism. So one extreme is the mind is intrinsically pure. Yeah? Another extreme is the mind is, is intrinsically defiled. Yeah? So the, the, sometimes people in Buddhism say either of these things. But the Buddha n never said anything about the mind, what the mind intrinsically was. What the Buddha said was that the mind is conditioned. Yeah? So if the conditions are there to be defiled, then there'll be defilement. If the conditions are there for the mind to be pure, the mind will be pure. The nature of the mind is neither purity nor defilement. The nature of the mind is to be conditioned. So through, uh, through the meditation process, we are learning what is the nature of that conditioning. And we do that even in very, very simple ways. In very basic meditation, we'll, we'll, we'll sit there, and even if you do just some simple meditation for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you start to look and you start to realize, oh, I'm, I'm feeling this angry feeling. I'm upset because of what somebody said to me at work today. Yeah? And then you're seeing that conditioning. Yeah? Oh, my mind is being influenced. My emotions are being influenced by my thoughts. My thoughts, why are my thoughts going that way? Because of what somebody said. So that's a sound, isn't it? Yeah? So there's a sound. It's a physical thing. It's influencing my emotional state. It's influencing my thoughts. And then that's influencing how I'm feeling that right now. And so we're seeing, even that very simple example, the conditionality of the mind. So please don't underestimate this. This is very, very profound. Once we understand the conditionality of the mind, we are in a position to do something about it. Okay? The mind isn't something which we're just given and we have to put up with. It's not something which we can't change. On the contrary, it's something which is changing all the time. So what we want to do with that is up to us. Yeah? We can choose to do nothing with it and just let the mind run its own course, or we can choose to say, hang on, the mind is important. Our life, our experience is important. What, what, this, this world, this conscious world within which we live, I need to take responsibility for that. I need to take some time and some effort to learn to understand that and work with that skillfully. And so this is uh, to accept the, uh, the responsibility of reflection and the responsibility of uh, looking in and understanding your own mind. So this is my little talk for this evening on awareness. So I offer this for your reflection.